This is the lecture for European history for Monday, the 23rd of May, 2022. And we just saw a brief clip uh, showing Katusha rocket launchers used by the Red Army to terrify and flatten opposition in advance of attack. And we saw two brief clips from the TV series The World at War about the firebombing of Dresden and about the after effects of the bombing, just to give you a visual impression of the scope of it. Okay, where we start, European theater of operation. You see ETO, that's what it means. This is a world war. Uh, so ETO refers to the European theater of operations. PTO, Pacific theater of operations. And this is the allied terminology. You can already hear the Americanization of terms. So we begin on the Eastern Front, between the Soviets and the Nazis. As you'll learn in more detail when we cover the final solution, the Jews of Eastern Europe were removed to a series of ghettos that were overcrowded. The Warsaw Ghetto is a medieval ghetto a section of the city that was reserved for Jews and though the city was expected to hold 25, 30, 40,000 people, it ended up holding five, ten times that amount. We're talking three, four, five hundred thousand people. In a situation like that, disease runs rife, there is not that much food, the water is foul. This was a simple way of killing Jews before you had to exterminate them. You just put them in an area where there are too many of them, and some will eventually die. One of the few cases where Jews rose up against their Nazi oppressors was in Warsaw, 1943. Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, not to be confused with the Warsaw Uprising of 44, which we'll talk about in a moment. In 1943, the Jewish residents of the ghetto got confirmation that the term resettlement to the east meant shipping to death camps at Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, and elsewhere. Given that the Jews were dead anyway, a number of younger Jews decided it's time to fight. If we're going to die, at least die killing these bastards. So, the Jews had been in contact with the Polish uh, National Army uh, and the Polish government in exile in London and uh, begged the Poles to join them. But the Poles knew that an uprising alone in one city would be a failure, that we needed, we being the Poles, uh, an allied army coming in to support us. We free ourselves, the allies sweep past, and we have done something to help win the war. 1943 is simply too early. The front in Russia is at Kursk, close to a thousand miles away. So, Poles say no. The Jews say we're, we're going anyway. We have to. We have no choice. So, Jewish men, women, and even children, took up arms that they had painstakingly captured from the Germans and fought the Germans, made an example, like they did every time force was used by Jews. There are reasons why the Jews didn't rise up in more cases. Early on, the Nazis had made an example of a few Jews who had risen up. They didn't just die, they were tortured to death using medical technology. It took days, in some cases weeks. The idea was go quickly, go quietly, go relatively painlessly, or we'll send you out of this world, the Nazis say, with a lot of suffering. But in this case, it's a choice of one death or another. So the ghetto is liberated for a little while, a few days. But the Germans fight their way back 
city block by city block, flattening everything, killing, capturing, mostly killing uh, these Jews that were uh, impertinent enough to rise up against them. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising fails, and the ghetto is emptied to Auschwitz down here. The Russians win at course, and they begin moving west to capture Belarus, parts of Ukraine, towards the Baltic states, and towards Poland. This is called Operation Bagration, named after a Napoleonic-era Russian general. It is so far the biggest offensive on the Eastern Front. It is bigger than Operation Barbarossa that the Germans had launched a few years before. This is summer 44. And in a series of punishing attacks, and the Russians attack by day, they attack by night, they are vicious, there is no mercy between these two sides. By this point, only the most anti-communist of Russians or the most blind of Russians still say that the Germans are liberators. What the Germans have done in Russia is truly obscene. Not just to the Jews, but to the Russians, to the white Russians, to the Ukrainians, and so forth. Had the Germans been smart, thank God they weren't, they would have made allies of the Russians and acted as liberators, freeing them from communists. But Hitler's racialist ideology says that the Russians are slave race people, they're Slavs. So, by this point, precious few Russians are fighting for the Germans. On the other hand, the Red Army has gathered in strength. It's now two years after Stalingrad, and their advances are mighty. And they drive to the eastern bank of the Vistula River, which is in central Poland. It's near, I think, the end of July and beginning of August, 1944. And with the sound of Russian artillery to the east, and with the sight of Russian aircraft overflying Moscow, I'm sorry, over, overflying Warsaw, uh, the Polish National Army, with their government in exile in London, rises up. This is the, Pol this is the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. At first, the Germans are stunned. They're already on their uh, back leg because of the Russian attack in Operation Bagration. This is an attack of brutal force. There's not much subtlety to it. And the Germans are basically in a state of panic, shell shock, and uh, stunnedness. But something interesting happens. Once the Polish National Army rises up in Warsaw, the Russians stop their attack. The Red Army halts on the eastern bank of the Vistula. The Germans, realizing that the Russians are pausing, vent their frustrations on the Poles. Forces that couldn't handle the Russians can certainly handle a bunch of Warsaw rebels. So the Germans take what little power they have and devote it to brutally destroying the Polish National Army in Warsaw. The Allies, of course, are in contact with the army because the government is next in exile is in London. And they beg the Russians to attack. The Soviets say, no, we can't. Uh, our mode of attack is to build up a massive overflow of supplies, lurch forward until those supplies are expended, and then we have to build up our supplies again. Operation Bagration used up all of our supplies. We need time to recover, which sounds superficially plausible. So the Allies say, well, why don't you do this? We have heavy bombers in Britain. We can hit Warsaw with bombs from London if we then can land and airfields that the Red Army controls, refuel, and return to London and bomb again. I mean, we'd love it if you blow us up with bombs here, so we could bomb them on both paths to and from. But this way, you don't have to expend forces, but we will help 
those who are sharing the battle with the Germans by fighting the Germans alongside us. The Russians say, we're sorry, uh, Red Army soldiers are very clear. And um, if it is flying and is not a Sturmovik or a Russian plane, our people are just as likely to shoot down whatever we see if it's not Russian. It would be a bad idea for you to send your planes because we would accidentally shoot them down. Now, the Warsaw Uprising of 44 is not an action really that involves World War II. It is the first battle of the Cold War. Stalin had a group of Polish communists. When his forces entered the city of Lublin inside of Poland, they proclaimed themselves to be the real Polish government. The Lublin Poles are communist stooges of Moscow, and everyone knows it. The last thing Moscow wants is for the Polish National Army to free Warsaw. They don't even want the Polish National Army around. So what the Soviets have done is they've advanced to the point where the Polish National Army rises, and now they are sitting back and watching them get slaughtered, because these are the Poles that would fight communism after the war. This is all about communism versus freedom. Very little to nothing about fighting the Germans. So the first action of the Cold War happens in late summer, early autumn, 1944, when the Soviets systematically insist that nothing can be done for the Poles. And nothing is done for the Poles. And after about a month, the Warsaw Uprising is crushed even more brutally than the Ghetto Uprising was a year before. And just as the Warsaw Uprising is crushed, the Russians resume their attack. So, bear in mind the nature of the Cold War and the nature of the alliance against Germany. The Russians are allied with Britain and the United States not because there's a common worldview, but because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's it. And there is every intention in Moscow to make damn sure that the Soviet Red Army moves as far west as possible and holds on to as much of Eastern Europe as possible to ensure that this will never, ever happen again. Or at least not for a very long time. Still, the right Red Army is the most powerful land force in human history. And it is unstoppable from 1943 through 44 through 1945. In early 1945, the Russians have reached the oder nisa line, just east of Berlin. There's some territory between Berlin and the river, but the Russians are on the eastern shore. Now, General Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Western Forces, had decided a couple of months ago not to try to reach Berlin. It's entirely possible that the American and British forces could have moved across northern Germany and taken Berlin before the Russians got there. But Eisenhower absolutely refused to see his military decisions as a result of post-war thinking. He did not want to think in terms of taking as much territory to the east as possible. Churchill did. Churchill understood that the Soviets would grab anything that their armies took. But Eisenhower said, no, we're allies, we're fighting the Nazis, that's our primary goal. The American and British forces can better be used to take Western Germany and the Czech lands near Prague. We'll let the Russians take Berlin. We'll let the Russians take the casualties, because the estimate was a million casualties for taking the city of Berlin. Eisenhower didn't want the Allies to suffer them. The Russians were willing to give the Russians Berlin. So now we come to it. Hitler has a decision to make. He is in a bunker, which is an underground bomb shelter, beneath the ruins of his new Reich Chancellery, basically his, uh, his, his, his White House. 
There are SS men in southern Germany and uh, Bohemia, uh, the Czech lands, that are trying to establish an Alpine redoubt, a uh, place for Nazism to reestablish itself and a place that because of its terrain would be so difficult for the Allies to attack that they can hold out maybe for years, for years. And they beg Hitler to leave Berlin. Ultimately, Hitler says, no, I'm not going to die running. Frederick the Great was once faced with an alliance of the French, the Austrians, and the Russians. The Russian Tsar died at a moment when it looked hopeless for Frederick. Maybe that'll happen now. Hitler always identified with Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great was also an artist. Frederick the Great was a sensitive soul who had to become a soldier. And Frederick the Great was the greatest of the Hohenzollerns. He saved Prussia when it seemed like no one could. Hitler knew that the alliance between the Reds and the Western Allies was a, uh, a very precarious one. And so he expected something to happen. And actually, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies during this period of old age. Hitler sees this as the moment. He sees it as the equivalent of the Russian Tsar dying. But it doesn't change anything. In his last days, the pressures of office get to the point where on one of the rare occasions, he loses control of his words and himself, which we will take a look at now. You might have noticed that he had trembling hands and his appearance was less than healthy. This is because, well, first of all, do you recognize the actor? Earlier in the year, we saw him playing Martin Luther's monk advisor, the nice old man with the bees. They call that actor because he made a very effective Hitler. Uh, <laughs> remember this the next time you see an actor giving testimony in a courtroom because that's their job. They make people feel. Um, here's what happened. We flash back to July of 1944. The Allies have landed in the West. The Russians, under Operation Bagration, are driving in from the East. Nothing that Hitler seems to do seems to have any effect. <coughs> and at this point, the plot that Pope Pius XII had set in motion so many years before finally gets close to it. Now, there have been attempts to assassinate the man before. Just before the war, there was an attempt to blow a pillar up behind him when he was going to speak on the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, but he left early, and then poof, it blew, and other people were hurt and killed, not him. But this time, it's going to work. Count Klaus von Stauffenberg is a Junker who's a military officer, a colonel, who's lost an arm and an eye fighting in combat. He's highly decorated and is now, at this point in July of 44, a military advisor that reports directly to Hitler from time to time. Von Stauffenberg has been involved in a plot amongst the senior levels of the German military and government to get rid of Hitler before it's too late. The Americans and British have landed in the West. The Russians are driving in from the East to save Germany from the bloodiest months of the war. And the last months are the bloodiest in the European theater. Um, we should kill Hitler and surrender. That's their plan. So the plan is for Stauffenberg to bring a briefcase with a bomb in it to a briefing with Hitler. The expectation is the briefing will happen in a bunker which is an underground bomb-proof chamber. If there's a bomb inside it, the bomb's force will be amplified by the small space. It'll shred everything inside. But, because it's hot that day, the um, bomb, the uh, conference that Hitler's going to attend is going to be held in a log cabin with a big, heavy wooden table. Well, that's the first problem. Now, uh, Stauffenberg plans on uh, activating the bomb, 
placing it in the room next to Hitler, and then getting called away by telephone. And that's what happens. He places the briefcase, having activated it, and gets called away by telephone. It happens, so he gets out. And the moment he's out of the chamber, uh, he gets in his car and leaves. Makes his way through the various security checkpoints, and he's going through the last one as the bomb goes off. Stauffenberg believes that the Valkyrie plot, that's the plot, that's the code word for success, has been successful, Hitler's been blown up, and he activates it. People in Berlin and throughout the German army who are anti-Hitler step forward and try to take command. But there's a softness, a squishiness to all of this. Nobody, Stauffenberg is in transit, and nobody is there to really take over. Why? Because these people are terrified that even if Hitler is dead, Hitler's uh, minions, Goebbels and uh, especially Himmler and the SS, will just start killing all of them. Killing Hitler might not be enough. So they are diffident and they are cautious at a time when they shouldn't be. But here's what happened uh, after Stauffenberg left the briefing. Another officer stepped to where Stauffenberg was, banged his foot on the briefcase, and moved the briefcase to the other side of a table leg. Now, this is a heavy, heavy table with heavy, solid legs. When the explosion happens, it follows the path of least resistance. The table leg actually shields Hitler from the blast. A number of other people are killed. Hitler is wounded. He develops a permanent uh, stitch and tremor in his left arm. And Hitler's health, which had already been dicey because he's a full-time vegetarian, um, his nutrition is off, and he's been taking morphine cocktails and cocaine cocktails since the beginning of the war in the form of injections from his doctor, uh, is going to be an even worse mental and physical condition. But he survives. The July, July 20th plot fails. The plotters, meanwhile, have bogged down in the question, is Hitler really dead? And the radio then broadcasts that an assassination attempt had been made, the Fuhrer is alive, and the Fuhrer speaks on the radio, and everyone knows his voice. So uh, the plotters are arrested, and Stauffenberg's lucky. He gets a firing squad that night. His last words are, long live holy Germany, which indicates his Roman Catholicism and his connection to the Pope's plot. Others are not so lucky. Hitler wants his revenge. So he sets up Stalin-style purge trials for a lot of these generals and has them humiliated publicly on camera and then has them killed by stringing them up with piano wire. Think about that. Uh, and they die slowly, kicking it. Hitler is known during this time to sit down after dinner and watch these home movies of the deaths of his generals who betrayed him. And he laughs as they kick and scream and try to live when they're, in fact, already dead. So Hitler, during the time from July 20th until early May, uh, is in an increasingly bad state. But at that moment... In late April 45, Hitler realizes the war is lost. I'll talk about the western part of the war later. So in the bunker, what Hitler does is, there's a birthday party. This is birthday, it's in mid to late April. And people visit him. Hannah Reich, Rausch who is the first female helicopter pilot in the world, flies a German helicopter into Berlin to attend his birthday party. Uh, what's weird is that the American Female Helicopter Pilot Association called the Whirly Girls considers Hannah Wright to be one of their members, even though she was an ardent Nazi uh, and remained one after the war. But she flew choppers, baby. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, on Hitler's last day, as the Soviets are shelling their troops or a block or two away, Hitler always promised that he would go out fighting. Well, he has a little party because he marries his longtime mistress, Ava Brown. That was the blonde in the German dress, folk dress. 
They've been lovers for about 10 years since Hitler's niece killed herself because Hitler was trying to be his niece's lover, which... So they get married, and after the wedding ceremony, they retire to the private quarters, and um, they each buy... Uh, Hitler gives uh, his wife uh, a cyanide pill, last pill, cyanide and cyanide. She bites down on it. She dies. Hitler swallows his Walther pre-38 pistol and shoots himself in the head. And the instructions are that their bodies are to be taken up, doused with gasoline, and burned, cremated like the old pagans of old. Goebbels, the little propaganda minister, and his wife are so loyal, or whatever, that they not only stay with Hitler until the end, but uh, Mrs. Goebbels, Magda Goebbels, poisons all of her children, and then herself, and Goebbels too. And their bodies are partially burned, but there isn't enough gasoline to fully consume them. So there are these grisly pictures of the buried corpses of Joseph and Magda Goebbels and their children. With Hitler finally dead, the remaining Nazis flee the bunker like rats fleeing a sinking ship. Um, some of them, like Martin Bormann, one of the people closest to Hitler, are killed by the Soviets. Others, like um, Hitler's secretary, no, I'm just having difficulty recalling it. Um, are taken by the Russians. Understand something. Terror is a form of communication. The Germans terrorized the Jews and everyone else in the Soviet Union when they attacked. So when the Soviets came back into Germany, they uh, reciprocated. It was payback time. 30 million Germans are killed in World War II. They want payback. So when an area with Germans is free, the combat troops pretty much fight their way through. They've got better things to do than worry about payback. They're trying to fight and stay alive. But the occupation troops, the second line troops that come in, go to the center of whatever group of houses there are. Frau! Kommen! Women! Come here! If the women come, anyone uh, over the age of eight and under the age of little old lady death, including little old ladies, are then raped in succession by entire units of Soviet troops. Then they search out, and if they find anyone who hid their women, the men would be killed in front of the women, and then the women would be raped as well, and then probably killed. The Japanese army and the Soviet army both used mass gang rape as a form of crowd control. While there were instances of British and American troops using uh, raping people, uh, it was rare and it was always punished. Um, but the uh, and while the Germans and the Italians did it sometimes, it wasn't policy. It is clearly policy of both the Japanese Imperial Army and the Soviet Red Army to use this form of terror as a way of breaking the spirits of anyone. After all, if you are a woman and you survive this, you'll never be the same. If you're a man and your women have survived this, you'll never be the same. This is about breaking the spirits of the German people, and it's pretty effective for many years. So, Hitler's dead. And with Hitler dead, his successor was going to be Rudolf Hess. But just before the so attack on the Soviet Union, Hess flew to Britain to try to make peace with the British, so that the British and uh, uh, so that the British uh, would at least be neutral in the war between Germany and Russia. After all, Hitler had tried had wanted really to make peace anyway. So Hess, he's out. Then there was Fatso Goering, the drug addict transvestite, head of the German Air Force. But in the days leading up to Hitler's suicide, um, Goebel, uh, 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 Goering says to the world, well, Hitler's trapped in Berlin. He can't command anything. I am taking over the Nazi state. Well, Hitler was still alive. 
So Hitler ordered Goering to be arrested, stripped of all his titles, stripped of all his rank, and thrown in a jail cell. He was going to have him killed. The Allies got to them first. So it's going to be the admiral who led the U-boat campaign, an ardent Nazi named Karl Dernitz. Dernitz takes command and for about a week and a half runs the war from, Flens uh, from yeah, Flensburg up near the Danish frontier. His job is mainly to surrender. And the Allies have a policy of unconditional surrender. That was agreed upon in the Casablanca Conference of 43. On May 8th, surrender is made to the Western Allies. The Soviets refuse to acknowledge it. On May 9th, surrender is made to the Soviets. And that's when they celebrate Victory Day over the fascists in what they call the Great Patriotic War. Now, this was achieved by a variety of things. We're going to talk about the Western Front tomorrow. But um, since Hitler is killed in the presence of Russian troops, it is necessary to tell the story this way. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I know, some dark stuff. Thank you for listening. <laughs>